Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at The Dentist, released in 1996. This may not be a well-known movie, but I imagine that most of you are already cringing at the gore implied by its title. The good news is that, while far from a classic, The Dentist does have a bit more to it than just close-ups of teeth being drilled and tongues being cut. Although there's plenty of that stuff too. In fact, this is a remarkably gross movie so it's a good thing I have a sponsor for today's episode. You ever go to the dentist and all they have playing is some crappy adult contemporary station? If only you had some high quality earbuds so you could listen to your own music while getting drilled. That's where today's sponsor comes in. Raycon offers premium earbuds that start at about half the price of its competitors on the market. They sound so great, you'll forget all about the evil dentist sticking needles in your gums. In fact, their latest model, the E25, is their best one yet. With six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and a compact design that'll give you a nice, noise-isolating fit. That way, you can just nod your head and pretend to listen as the dentist tells you you need to floss more. I'm really happy with my pair of Raycons. I use them while I cook to listen to political podcasts for my daily dose of outrage. Go to buyraycon.com slash deadmeat to get 15% off an order for yourself, which you can use to listen to the Dead Meat podcast, a much less depressing listen than hearing about today's state of politics. That's buyraycon.com com slash dead meat for 15% off your order today. Oh, and one last thing about this sponsored video. I know normally I have both a tame version and an explicit version for these, but if you didn't see my Twitter thread a few weeks ago, doing that actually seriously messed up my channel's placement in the YouTube algorithm. To avoid having that happen again, I'm just gonna go all out in this episode and include everything. Minus the nudity, of course. So if seeing toothy torture upsets you, just get ready to close your eyes a bunch. But like I was saying before the ad break, the dentist does have a bit more to offer than just that. For one thing, Corbin Burnson, who plays the titular killer, puts in a remarkably devoted performance. It's a shame that his hallucinating OCD Dr. Alan Finestone doesn't get more recognition alongside other campy horror killers. Another thing that helps the movie is that it was co-written by Stuart Gordon and directed by Brian Usna, the guys who brought us Reanimator. Now, to be clear, this is very much a Brian Usna film, not so much a Stuart Gordon one. And by now, you should be getting a decent feel for what that means. After all, we've looked at his bugtastic Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, his Balls to the Walls reanimator sequels, and I've mentioned society enough times that you've gotta be getting curious about it. The dentist sees Yuzna's low-budget cult sensibilities shine through and reflect off the wall-to-wall -wall whiteness of its production design. He amps up the stylization with a lot of wacky warp effects and by mixing reality with fantasy, all while sprinkling in a bit of sleaze, as can be expected by the guy. Again, the end result isn't gonna make anyone's top 10 list, but there is enough effort here to make an enjoyable and relatively unique viewing experience. How many kills will we discover waiting for us beneath this movie's surface? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with a shadow puppet show. Oh, do the dinosaur that eats everyone up. These expressive hands belong to Dr. Alan Finestone, DDS, currently practicing invisible dentistry in a padded white room. And how did he get here? Well, shut the fuck up for a minute and he'll tell you. God, right after he drills into this title card. Alan used to live a life of privilege in a big old Los Angeles home with a beautiful wife named Brooke. But things weren't exactly as perfect as they appeared to be. And I'm not just talking about his cufflink situation. When I wear white shirts, I wear my diamond cufflinks, but I can't wear my diamond cufflinks because they're still at the jewelers having the stones reset, unless, of course, you pick them up for me. No, on this, the day of their wedding anniversary, Alan learns that something is rotten beneath the pristine white veneer of his marriage. Nothing. No matter how good or how pure is free of decay. The decay that Alan discovers is a serious case of infidelity when he sees Brooke making out with Matt the pool boy. Oh damn, she going straight for the pool noodle, huh? The sight of her joyous affair drives Alan to retrieve a gun from his desk, which he puts up to the paramours while telling Brooke to bite down. Except, just kidding, the gun thing was only a fantasy he was having. Come on, Alan, you can't stand around daydreaming like that. You've got to get to work, because freaking Mark Ruffalo is in your office on account of his beauty pageant client, April Rain. 
insane. Alan's staff tries to call him on his car phone, but he screens it so he can follow Matt to a neighbor's house. The neighbor, this Ziggy Stardust looking chick named Paula, catches him in her front yard, but he makes up an excuse and she thinks nothing of it, especially since she's got a pool boy to dive into. Damn, Matt, you're making the rounds in this neighborhood, aren't you? Before Alan can leave, he's attacked by Paula's dog, who gets out of the gate and runs at Alan like he's in a Beggin' Strips commercial. Bacon, 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 it's bacon! But it's not bacon, it's a gunshot. And now that dog is dead. Cue all the angry comments. Alan finally gets to his office and stares down the Zolly hallway as April Rain is brought into one of his themed rooms. Welcome to heaven. Yeah, think of Alan as the depressed Walt Disney of dentistry. He's got all sorts of themed rooms, like a heaven one and a uh, jungle one, I guess. We've turned dentistry into interactive medicine. It's a shame that half-assed theming isn't a good cure for the emotional damage that comes from being cheated on. You know I don't want you anymore. The talking pictures don't help either. Alan begins a routine inspection on a young patient, and get ready to be uncomfortable, cause here come the mouthy close-ups. Honestly, it's not all that bad without the sound, so you're welcome. Cause trust me, with the sound, this movie's a tough one to watch. Alan begins to zone out and talk about his wife, and the next thing you know, he's hallucinating a bunch of rotten teeth in this little boy's mouth. That leads to a nasty mouth stab and some bleeding gums Murphy style. Shit, shit, uh, blame it on the kid. He has to learn to sit still. Yeah, it's his fault. Next up on Alan's patient list is April Rain, still chilling in the heaven room. Although Alan's employee Karen says April's mouth is all good, Alan sees a shadow on one of her x-rays, so he puts her in the chair and gasses her up with nitrous oxide. In the lobby, April's manager Steve tries to nab himself an extra client by talking to this teenager Sarah, who's eagerly awaiting to get her braces removed. Shit, he even gives her his card. I wonder if all the Avengers carry around cards like that. But Sarah's little turn on the catwalk doesn't hold his attention for long. He's too concerned about April missing an appointment they have scheduled. She's probably not gonna be able to make it though, dude. Not with how gassed up Doc Feinstone has her right now. Like the monster that he is, Alan begins to take advantage of April's semi-conscious state before full-on hallucinating that it's his wife lying back in the chair. After pulling down April's pantyhose, Alan hears his imaginary wife mention Matt the pool boy, so he starts choking her out. But remember, man, that's not Brooke, it's April. And with the nitrous tank having run empty, she's now coming to in a very compromised condition. She gets away from him and out into the hallway, where Steve sees her and rescues her from the rapey DDS. Alan tries to make up an excuse. Excuse. Yes, she's had a, a minor reaction to a small dose of nitrous oxide, that's all. Wow. But despite Steve's initial astonishment and reaction to the story, wow. he learns the truth soon enough, since he comes back later to punch Alan in the face. Bam! Bitch went down! His employees Karen and Candy help him get up off the ground, and he apologizes to the waiting room and says that's gonna be it for him today. Sorry, Sarah. Come back tomorrow to be a brace face no longer. Before the staff clears out, though, another employee named Jessica finds April's pantyhose in the heaven room, and she can tell right away that they're not Dr. Feinstone's size. That night, Brooke dresses up in her finest little black dress and goes to Alan's office to meet him there before their anniversary dinner. She finds him in the back, where he shows her his latest creation, an opera-themed room. My finest achievement. <laughs> yep, there's nothing I would look forward to more than having opera music play while getting a cavity filled. Alan asks Brooke to indulge him for a moment by taking a seat in the dental chair for a pre-dinner teeth cleaning. Romantic! But then, Alan Feinstone, BDDSM, ties Brooke to the chair by her neck and gasses her unconscious with that N2O. As an opera singer wails away, he pries open her mouth and gets to work. Look away if you need to, motherfuckers, cause ain't nobody's favorite thing to watch a tooth getting pulled. Aside from that close-up tooth extraction, though, the rest of the dental devilry he does to Brooke isn't shown in graphic detail. Still, when he's done, it leaves her mouth mouth deformed all the same. The next morning, Alan gets a visit from Detective Gibbs and his partner with a fake-ass sounding name. This is Detective Sunshine. Gibbs is played by genre mainstay Ken Foray, last seen on the kill count in Rob Zombie's Halloween as Grizzly Joe. And he asks Alan if he happens to own a firearm, suspecting him to be responsible for shooting Paula's dog. Alan says he doesn't, and the detectives leave him for now, right before Matt arrives reporting for pool duty. He skims the swimming hole and finds a 
human tongue among the leaves. And Matt, guess whose tongue that is? It's Brooks! Yeah, dude, you knew that tongue well. You know, back when it was still attached. Matt is so distracted by Brooks' bruised mouth that he doesn't hear when Alan comes behind him and slits his throat with a kitchen knife. Alan slashes at Matt a few more times before delivering a stab to the chest, killing the dirty pool man once and for all. Well, now don't throw that in there, man. You're gonna have to get that later. Alan goes to work where his neighbor Paula has an appointment to fix her filling. In a room with an ill-defined, uh, music note theme, Alan stabs into his neighbor's gums with a local anesthetic. Paula starts talking about Matt the sexy pool guy, and lady, you probably don't want to be doing that as this dude takes a drill to your teeth. Otherwise, he's apt to fucking excavate your molar like a gold mine. Shit! Jessica pulls Alan into the hallway and asks him, hey, why are you turning that lady's teeth into smelly bone dust like that? He tells her not to question him, but she does while he's busy talking to Karen, since she tells Paula to get the heck out of there before her teeth are ground down to nubs. Alan grows enraged at the insubordination and fires Jessica, who responds by taking out April's pantyhose and accusing him of being as rapey as he is. But his warped mind can't handle that kind of dirtiness, so Alan takes the pantyhose to Jessica's neck and pulls her inside the music note room before anyone else can see. Jessica fights back a bit and even tries to stab him with a dental tool, but his pressure with the pantyhose around her neck is too much, and he ends up strangling her to death. Sad to see her go. I actually really like all of Alan's employees. They're surprisingly good characters. In the waiting room, Sarah's name is called, and she rejoices that it's finally time to get her braces off. But before she can get back there, a dude comes in and cuts in front of her. He's Marvin Goldblum from the IRS. Because not only does this movie have a whole cop side plot that I can pretty much entirely ignore, it's also got a tax evasion storyline going on in the background. Gotta love it. Marvin is taken into the jungle themed room, and among the fake foliage, he tells Alan that his tax returns have been looking pretty suspicious lately. Something about deductions. They don't really bother getting into specifics. Marvin then extorts Alan and says that he won't take this to his supervisor as long as Alan gives him free dental work? Is that what's going on here? What the fuck? Anyway, you pretty much know what to expect here. Alan ties Marvin to the chair, sticks a dental clamp in his mouth, and cranks that soldier boy all to hell. Oh man, that is some nasty shit. And don't worry, friends, it gets worse. Alan grabs a drill and fucking drills into Marvin's tongue. What the fuck? I hate that there were no behind the scenes footage I could find for this movie. I wanted to see someone making that fake tongue. The cops wind up back at Alan's house, and after seeing some drippy blood, they head into the backyard and find some serious PC, which leads to Gibbs entering the house and discovering Brooke tied up in their bedroom upstairs. She's looking pretty bad there, almost as bad as Marvin, who Karen finds in the jungle room. His mouth is entirely broken, but for our purposes, I must point out that he is still alive. Alan walks into the room and monologues to Karen before beating her head against the wall and killing her in a simple yet horrifying way. He sticks an air-filled syringe in her neck and pushes the plunger, inducing a brain aneurysm. I don't even know how they did that air bubble effect, but it leads to one shaky and horrific end for Karen. Alan finally agrees to see Sarah, and inside the heaven room, he removes her braces after two long years. Yo, did any of you smell your braces when you got them removed? Cause I did. They smelled nasty. Although Sarah's happy with her smile, Alan sees another mouthful of rot. And since there's no floss in that away, his only recommendation for her involves some cold hard steel. He has another wifey hallucination, and Sarah takes advantage of his momentary zone out to smack him in the head and make a run for it. And although he tries to stop her, she bites the hand that cleans and gets away. She hides in the gas closet as he searches for her, but turns out that place is Akupado. So she then runs off to the jungle room, where she finds Karen's corpse and a still-living Marvin. In fact, the last time we see Marvin, he falls down on Alan to help Sarah escape, and his arms are still waving around as Alan leaves him. So I'm not gonna count that dude is dead. He'll probably just need some serious orthodontal work. Alan eventually corners Sarah in the opera room, where he bangs on his chest and invites her to be his guest at the Finestone Funhouse. Let me in. With a gun to her head, Sarah promises her dentist that she'll brush her teeth three times a day and never eat candy again. And apparently, that's good enough to satiate him, because when the cops arrive at his office, they find Sarah, but no Finestone. He's run off to a dental school he teaches at. A last minute addition to this movie that I'm guessing they added when they realized the script was only 79 pages long. He snaps in a hurry and tells all of the dental students there to start pulling every tooth in sight. I want everybody 
to extract. Dude, are you sure that's like the right thing to- I SAID EXTRACT! Whoa, man, it's dental school. Chill out. Ellen is having some warpy hallucinations when the cops arrive, and they chase him through the hallways until he winds up in the theater department, mesmerized by an opera student performing by herself on stage. With one final mental brook down, Alan is reduced to his knees and disarms himself. The cops find him and apprehend him on stage while he imagines his wife laughing at him. The climax of his cuckold preoccupation. Er, you guys are gonna apprehend him, right? Or are you just gonna stand around and look at him? You want I should move the spotlight and show you where he is, or...? Eventually, they get around to arresting Finestone, and that's how he winds up in the padded room we first met him in 90 minutes ago. Looks like part of his regular treatment at this psych ward is some vengeance dentistry delivered by his lovely wife. And something tells me he won't be getting any stickers when the visit is over. How many people did Alan Finestone scrape from the surface of the Earth? Let's stop forcing the dental puns and get to the numbers. Assuming that Martin dude lived, only three people died in the dentist. One guy and two gals. But don't go eating that pie char now. It's too sweet for your teeth. With a runtime of 92 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 30.67 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Karen. It may not be the bloodiest, but it's always kind of stuck with me. I think actor Patty Toy does a great job selling it too. Doll Machete for lamest kill will go to Jessica since she just got strangled. Although admittedly, it was done with some pantyhose. I suppose that adds some flair. And that's it. The Dentist came out in 1996 and had a sequel release two years later. We'll look at that on Sunday, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching The Kill Count on The Dentist. I want to thank some patrons like Jace Rose, Kevin Delator, Richard Piccolo, Alex Davila, Joshua Ward, and Mariana Lovegood. Another thanks to Raycon as well for sponsoring this very messy movie. And finally, you're almost out of time to order the Dead Meat Collector's Edition of In Search of Darkness, the 80s horror documentary. Details in the description below. Thanks everyone, be good people.